So let's do this. The way we always lead these off in the past was people introducing themselves a little bit. But what I want to do first is introduce some friends of mine, right? So I want to introduce Anish and Lee. We're going to be picking their brains on how they are scaling their real estate business because both of them do a lot of volume. This guy does a lot of volume and a lot of luxury stuff, right? That's right. And you also have like a cabinet business and like a staging business. So there, there's a, a lot to learn from both these guys, right? So what we're going to do is just ask them some really in-depth questions. And I know, I know that there's a lot of investors that do stuff at scale just looking at the audience, right? I see Jake here as well. So this is your opportunity to just be like, how are you doing this, right? And how are you finding the deals? And I can already tell you, I know how this guy finds the deals. He's just aggressive, right? Right? I don't know. I don't know how Anish does it, but I would imagine there's a certain level of aggressiveness. How many? How many did you do in the last like 18 months? 78. 78. 78 flips in the last 18 months. Wow. Okay. So that's a lot. Now, I don't think you've done that many, but you've done a lot, right? And you do a lot of luxury stuff. So what would you say? 15, 10, 5? 15. Yeah, somewhere around that? Ish. Well, it's hard to get deals in this market, right? Like, let's, it's, it's hard to get deals. So we want to find out how they're finding deals, how he's scaling a fix and flip business of 78 transactions. Because that's a hard business to scale. It's why so many people start wholesaling, and then they move into rehabbing, and then they go back to wholesaling. Because wholesaling is easier to scale many times, right? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but before we get started, why, why don't you... Why don't you introduce yourself? Name of your company, if you have a business partner, if it's all you, go ahead. So my name is Anish Gupta. Uh, I have been doing this for about uh, six years full time. I used to be in IT, so I used to do part time before that. And that's my brother, Law Sahil. He's also my business partner. So he has been doing uh, this for a bit me for almost three years now. So we've been scaling up the flips and rentals for the last uh, three, four years and uh, significantly. And uh, we are also classic contractors in Virginia and DC and Maryland. So uh, just thought it would be easier to become a contractor rather than keep hiring more contractors. Sure. Uh, which we also do. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's uh, uh, most of it. Okay. Lee, what about you? Lee, Bryce Enterprise. I own a cabinet company, Bryce Cabinetry. Um, I do have a staging company. So my primary focus, I try to do. Um, my sweet spot is one and a half to two million dollar. Um, I don't do that many flips. Uh, I find it very difficult to see the margin. Uh, I typically buy the properties that nobody else wants. I figure out a solution how to make it work for me. And so far, so good. And yeah, I've been spending a whole lot of time building the cabinet cabinetry company. And because I want to, I want to control my design. I want to control my consistency. Um, got tired of dealing with folks that are not getting back to me on time. The price goes ups and downs, and, and uh, so yeah, I just started importing myself. So what I heard was he's built a construction business because of his investment business. So there's an ancillary services from that, which is what Mark and I did. So for those that don't know, that's my business partner, Mark Beckett, runs our construction investment arm, right? And Mark, you want to talk about the what you do? Yeah. You know? So, like I said, uh, Rob, you focus largely on the realty side of the house, right? Right. Buyer and seller business, a couple dozen Title, agents. Title, mortgage, time. insurance. Right. right. You need it sold, you need it bought. Rob's your guy. I focus largely on the investment side, the occasional rehab. That business turned into a construction business because we had the same thought. Oh, well, we, we know people who do good stuff. We've met other contractors that you know, know what they're doing. We know what a good house looks like. We have a lot of clients that need work done on houses before they go on the market. So we start doing a little over here, and it gets bigger, and it gets bigger. Next thing you know, we've got a construction department that does a lot of pre-sale renovation work. So that's another thing that we do. Anybody needs a house fixed up before it sells, well, let me know. We'd be happy to help with that. Uh, while occasionally trying to get ourselves into uh, a deal or two, uh, we do rentals. We've got Airbnb properties coming online. Uh, and occasionally, who's, who's bought some Airbnb properties in the last 12 months here? I'm just curious. Okay. 
I've seen a lot more of that here I recently. Like, I would have thought more hands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody so I thought like, was like, oh, yeah, I got an Airbnb. Oh, yeah, I got an Airbnb. I would love yeah. to be part of that. Yeah. <laughs> are you looking for one? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people are looking, right? Okay. So do a little bit of that. Uh, yeah. And then a lot of bit of this, because this is kind of where we get our business from, right? It's talking to people. By so, the way, one of the right number one ways that we find deals is by networking with you guys, right? So somebody knows of a property somewhere, um, you know, networking is probably what, that, that's how you got your deal that you did in my neighborhood, right? Yeah. An agent that you knew told you about that deal, yeah. right? Yeah. And the next thing I know, he bought this choice piece of property in the neighborhood that I live in, and I was, I was like, damn, that was mine, right? <laughs> that one, right? But he got it first, and he was more aggressive, right? Yeah. So it was good, good stuff. Uh, your checkbook with you, when you go on your deals. Right? That's right. <laughs> you write it right then and there. Don't think about it. Yeah, 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 for sure. Okay, so let's do this. Um, we're not going to go through everybody here like we normally do, but let's just show, uh, raise hands. Who here is a wholesaler? Raise your hand. Okay. By Fix the way, it. if you put a property under contract, you're a wholesaler whether you know it or not because someone else will buy it. Somebody will buy it. Okay. Who rehabs properties here? Right? Okay. Look around. Who is a lender, private lender? Okay. The money's here tonight. I like it. Who's doing rentals at scale? Okay. What kind of rentals? Multifamily. Multifamily. Okay. What, what area of multifamily? Like what location? Oh, Carolinas and uh, southern states. Okay. The southern states. Looking in Tampa right now. Tampa, yeah. right? Yeah, St. Pete is an area that I like. Okay. Creative financing. Anybody do creative financing? Wraps. A little bit of creative notes. Okay. A little bit of that. Okay. Just to get a feel for the room. So what I would recommend you do is after we have this discussion. Oh, Opa! Already. Opa. Get another glass. Get another glass. Okay. What I recommend is after we have this discussion, the most powerful thing that you guys can do is network with each other. We always say the power is in the network, it's in the relationships all around you. We can share with you what we do to find deals, but at the end of the day, you need to meet somebody, find somebody, find a lender, find a realtor, find a rehabber, find a contractor, find somebody that has cabinets. That's how business gets done, and then you need to put them in your database. This is why we do this, so that you guys can learn from each other, okay? So, okay, let's talk a little bit about, I'm gonna interview you guys, okay? And I need you to project so that people online can, can see, okay? Where are you doing your investing? Is it Nova, is it DC, is it Maryland? Like, what areas do you like best? So, we started off doing a lot of business in Maryland, but then we have PG County, Charles County, Montgomery County. I believe in doing more starter homes, like three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars everyday homes. They'll sell like this very quickly. But ever since COVID happened, that new year has dried up. Wow. At least for me, I've not been able to find the deals or the numbers that I like. It dried up because competition got more yeah, intense. More and more investors okay. got it. Okay. So the competition is so intense, and uh, our business shifted to more DC and Virginia. Okay. We still do deals in Maryland. We still have a few going on right now, and all this has something going on. Uh, but uh, I don't do much Baltimore City. Uh, I don't like those ten, fifteen thousand dollar townhouses. Okay. That's not my business. Yeah. Uh, we do more starter homes, five, six hundred thousand up to a million dollar homes. We have done bigger deals as well, but I like to stay uh, under a million for each deal, maybe one point two, one point three. Um, Can I stop you for a second? Yeah. Anish, you and I met. How many years ago? Four? Three? Well, I used to come to Casa Group uh, okay. when it started. Okay. Uh, nine, eight, nine years ago. Okay, so eight or nine years back, and you weren't doing any deals, doing any zero deals. deals. I just had one rental, and that's when I started coming to you. Okay. <clears throat> and then, like, when did you start, like, going really heavy? Six years back. Six years back. Okay. So it took about three to four years of, like, learning, processing, debt, doing a little bit, and then you were, like, I'm this gonna. Is what I want to do. I'm no longer gonna go in IT. Do IT. I'm gonna go all in. Yeah. 
and it was a terrible mistake, right? <laughs> you should have still missed those IT days. You should have waited. You missed those IT days. Yeah. You should have waited another four or five years before buying your first deal, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Grass is always green on the other side, right? So. Yeah. I'm sorry for cutting you off because I just literally had this flashback of remembering like that you were wet behind the ears yeah. when we and now I'm like, okay, how'd you buy seventy eight Robert? Right? So it's cool to see right. that. Okay. So, I mean, since then we have been buying, buying, and I mean, obviously flipping. I like to stay in a deal less than six months. Uh, we usually flip a deal within four to five months. Uh, I mean, the longer projects with the uncertainty of the market, I don't like those. I mean, we have done condo conversions, uh, multi families, and things like that, but I usually try to stick to single family homes, townhouses, condos. Uh, I mean, the DCDs are good. Are good, but the market is going up. Yeah. In this kind of market, I'm not sure. So, yeah. uh, I want to be sure about what I'm doing. So. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, who's a little bit worried about the market right now? Raise their hand. Okay, we've got some people raising their hand. Right? I have some of the veterans in here, like, it's going to crash! Right? I mean, we don't know, right? Like, we don't, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know. Inventory levels, though, are still low. We're 3 million homes shy of where we need to be for new household formation. So, we'll see. I mean, think about this. What were interest rates a year ago? Right, three, two? And right now they're five, five two? Yeah, that's right, that's right. So, it's gonna slow it down. I mean, the Fed wants to slow everything down. That's just gonna create opportunity. It's gonna create opportunity. Right. So don't let it scare you. You just have to know how to shift. <clears throat> what I heard him say was he had to shift off his original business model and start moving into our, like into Virginia and DC. Yes. Right? So most of the houses that I'm doing now are not the first time home buyer. I mean there's some, but most of the second time home buyers and uh, people who know what they're buying. I mean, okay. The first time home buyers, I mean they'll buy anything. I mean not saying they're not mature enough, but uh, if those houses are easier to sell, there's a market for those kind of home buyers more as compared to second or third. I mean, obviously, the market for $2 million, $3 million homes is less as yeah. compared to $500, $600. Let me do this. Let me ask Lee a question. He just gave us his house avatar. He has essentially an avatar for the type of home and the type of buyer for that home. It's one of the things that you need to do is start developing what I call zones. What kind of house and what kind of, what area? Lee, what about you? Like, what do you look for? I know you buy in Arlington, Arlington, Church. Vienna, Falls Church. I like to do my new constructions in Vienna, Arlington. I got a deal right now. Uh, purchase price is incredible, 750. We're negotiating at 2.2 exit right now. So that should give me uh, enough to eat for a while. Okay. And then I got, um, um, I'm working in Warren County, try to get a rezone for 13 townhouses right now. Um, I just put uh, two properties in uh, uh, Bryce Resort in Bay Sea, Virginia on a contract. Um, I got a project in Rockville right now. I got a project in Warrington right now, thanks to you. And, oh yeah, I got- By, by the way, it has its own water feature. Oh, absolutely, I got myself a pond. And um, it's been a lot of water. Yes, yes, a lot. Twenty-five gallons for every five minutes, and and uh, it was fun. And um, I also have a few deals in DC, and all my deals in DC are already pre-sold. And it's all about the networking. Agents know who I am. They know what type of product I'm pumping out, and uh, I don't I don't go short change on my flips. Um, Can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Do you market? Or do they, or do you just talk to a lot of people and they bring you deal? Like, what is your strategy? Do I, really, you have I really don't market very much, and I get people email me from time to time looking for certain things. Um, you know, I, I like to believe I have a decent reputation. Uh, people know that I, I, I take care of my product and I, I love what I do. So um, my product generally, you know, sells itself. Okay. So, what about you? Are you marketing? Are you working? Like, how do you find your deal? How, so, how do you find 78 deals in the last 12 months? So I'm, I've been doing everything. Everything okay. and anything that makes me deal. And once the deal comes, I don't let the door. I'll just get that problem. I, mean, I get very, very aggressive. 
offer the very aggressive my deals. Can you speak up? Yeah. I get very aggressive on getting the deals once the deal comes to me. So my deals, most of the deals come through MLS. I mean, I, I find those deals, I put an offer, I get very aggressive on my offers, cash offers, no contingency to do within seven days, very quickly. What I noticed about your projects were that you were always, and it's worked out so far, you were always making them nicer than what the, the neighbor, like your model was, I'm going to make them nicer than anything else in this so neighbor, I, and you're breaking records. I get a notch higher with my renovations. Uh, I try to make sure whatever the comps are, uh, we have a product which is better than those products. My comps are always at the comps, right? I mean, when I'm buying a property, the ARV is at the comps, and we try to overshoot that. Okay. I mean, it has worked out with these kind of homes, but I mean, maybe not in the future. Yeah, and so we, we might, you know, normally we would never advise that. It's like, hey, the, the, the comps are the comps are the comps, and they're overshooting those comps. But his product was so much nicer than anybody else's product when I would go into it. Same thing with yours, man. And no, I, I agree with that 100%. I think just that oh, property in your in neighborhood, neighborhood, right? <laughs> 200000 higher than any other house, than the last house. So, let's talk about real quick how you're able to do that, though. You have in-house design. You have yes. designers on staff. Yes. Right. Do you still want to promote anything you're not offering? Do you still do design services for other people? Sometimes I do. Um, I don't get along with a lot of people. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you have staff for that. I, I've been around for a little too long. Got stiff a couple of times, so I want to say that out, uh, you know, out in the open. So when folks take care of me, I take care of them, and I'm happy to do design packages. Even the people that I have trained, that they're in, going independent, they're very successful right now. You use one of them, and I think there's she's still pumping out product for you. And uh, so yeah, to answer your question, yes, I still do some design packages, but I don't do it you know, that often anymore. But that, if I was going to say there's a secret sauce to what you were doing, I would say it's. You're looking for value where other people might not see it. You had a house in Vienna where the foundation of the house didn't face the street. Yeah. So it's cheaper to leave a foundation in place and build over top of it than to, to undig a foundation and start over with a new build. Right. So you left the foundation in one direction, built the house on top in another, yep. right? Uh, that's not a thing that a lot of people might have thought of, and it worked out really well. You built a really nice house on top, had all the benefits of the shorter permitting period, the design flexibility on the unit on top, by thinking differently and saying, all right, I think I can build this to where someone's going to be okay with it, even though things don't typically line up the way maybe they normally would be looking for. Yeah, that was, that was a good deal. I think we picked up in the... Uh, mid fours, we exit 1.4-ish, and um, so it was a 11, um, 1,200 square feet Rambler, one of those um, uh, Ramblers that were facing each other at a 45 degree angle. Um, I did my comps at the time, and I didn't really like the idea of demoing everything. So face it, when you demo everything, you pop in a new construction, $20,000 is on your demo, and your excavation at that at that time it was about 35 40k and then pumping a new foundation you're looking at another 35 to 40 thousand dollars so here I am saying goodbye to hundred thousand dollar my money I'll never get it back so um, what I what I do a little bit differently is I know how to draft so I took the layout I just started with pencil outlines and I, I put on AutoCAD, I started drafting it and figured out how I would build it, how I would live it. So I sleeved a basement on top of basement and the rest of it, it will be, you know, gravel. And, and uh, so the appraiser walked it, he never even know the differences, right? And uh, they just go, wow, I wonder why the, the builder put basement and crawl space. Well, I'm not going to tell you, but hey, just give me my appraisal, I'm happy, right? So, because you built a house at a 45 degree angle and made it work. Found value where someone else might not have seen value. So if you guys will walk the property today, you will not know the staircase going down is sitting at a 45 degree angle. 
right? So by adding texture walls, and including Horton Batten, certain design elements, you take the focus away, right? I didn't purposely put in any windows down there. Well, how am I gonna put windows? I got crawl space here, I got crawl space here. I'm gonna have a long tunnel going out, right? So I'm gonna have to offer certain different, uh, different design packages offset my negatives, right? So um, I offered a built-in fireplace, stack stone, I offer surround sound, and basically the basement is ready to live in, right? So when, when we staged it, and that's why I bought a staging company, because I know my style. And, you know, I bought a pool table, foosball table, anything I could think of, I'd throw it into the basement. And I only have 1,200 square feet to furnish, which is, doesn't cost me that much money. Um, I think, you know, I mean, I came out okay. Yeah. And I, I think this got parallels in other kinds of real estate businesses, like the Airbnb business. What's really cool about your houses, Leo, they are unique. They have more trim detail, they have a different design than what you'll see. Airbnb is the same thing. Just like we found out the last few years, you can't just buy the cheapest house in the neighborhood, throw 40 grand at it, and try to make money because everybody is doing that. You can't just buy a, a house. So you're going to rent it out day by day and just expect it to make a couple hundred bucks a day. It's got to be different. It's got to be unique. You have to try to find value or provide value unique to what other people are doing, right? So let me let me ask a question. Let me ask you. So you're doing 78 houses a year. That means that you need a lot of crews. Are you in charge of the crews? Okay, okay. You need, who's project managing this? How many crews? Like what's the what's that machine look like? So, I mean, when you have so many projects going on, it's is this where like your IT background comes into play? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's, just, it's impossible to structure. It's okay. like when you have twelve rehabs going on. I mean, like you have to go to all the properties. I make sure that we go to all the properties. It's impossible to go to all the properties. It's not going to help us. They're all in the place, and uh, we have about. I think 10 crews working for us right now, and they're doing properties. We have a system in place how we want to do the properties. They know they have brand new people. They have to, um, so did you do something like each house is going to get this kind of color? Like you have packages. We do have packages. Okay, so so that that is really really important. So when you start scaling, you could start developing packages. You could say, hey, we want this to look like this package, and then you have like the color scheme. Possibly the lighting scheme, the hardware scheme, the cabinet scheme, yeah. like all that? Absolutely. Okay. So, I mean, depending on, like I said, I mean, if we are getting a $500,000 house, we try to do a notch higher, we try to do appliances which are better than the neighborhood. I mean, if we're doing a million dollar house, we try to do Viking, where everyone else is doing Samsung or something to eat money from. So, we try to do a notch higher. We are spending 10, 15, 20,000 more on the renovation, but it comes back to us. Yeah. It's either going to sell faster and for more money. Yeah. I mean, like you said, you have to have a uniqueness in place because you have to set apart as compared to what everyone else is doing. Same thing with Airbnb. I mean, everyone is doing smaller housing, not renovating them, and just putting a tenant in there or a short term rental in there. You have to set yourself apart, some or the other. I mean, there are countertops that are looking the same right now, so you have to figure out a way how you're going to set it apart little bit so that your product is better than the, the neighborhood. Lee, I got a question for you. So we know that the real estate market right now is been hot, right? There's no inventory, it's competitive, but we also know interest rates have gone up quite a bit. And so I'm always thinking, what does this look like six months from now? What does this look like a year from now? And what moves should we be making today to anticipate what might come, right? So. What are you, like, are you thinking that? Are you, are you preparing? I am not too worried about that, right? Okay. And I think Arlington, compared to New York, compared to everywhere else, still underpriced. So, and all, all I, I agree with Nish, and, and that's a great philosophy. We try to do exactly the same thing. Uh, in fact, the Kaza Group, um, you just sold one of our, our, our new constructions last year. Um, I think we, we exit at 1.75, right? Mm -hmm. 1.7, somewhere right around there. I think the interior finishings, all the finishings we put in are $2 million finishings. Yeah, it's gorgeous. And Mark and I, we got into a disagreement. He says, I don't think your house is going to sell for that price because you don't have a 
rear sliding door to the backyard. So you know what I did? I did a board and batten wall in the garage. And no one asked me about a sliding door. And they just, they open the garage, they see the back door, they go, wow, look at that wall. I think Mark himself was impressed. He brought his nice car. We did some photo shoots right there. And that came out super nice. And then I think we that's what's so nice. Right. Yeah. yeah, no, no. You're right. Stage. And 9 11 uh, makes everything look good. Right, right, exactly. The 9 11 sold the house. So, um, again, I, I, you know, I like to pick up properties other developers don't want, right? And so. Because that lot was complicated. Very complicated. Yeah. And I was able to get a new construction permit less than four months. It's about solving problems. So I looked at something. So I learned something today, right? Like Anisha is looking at properties in the MLS. For the longest time, I've been like, D don't even look at the MLS because you can't get a deal. Well, they might be looking at it through a slightly different lens than I'm looking at it, right? I've done my deals on the MLS. Okay. I love the MLS. Okay. Well, there you go. We're wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, I mean, I have. I will have my wife write the uh, write the offer, and um, there you have it. Okay. And I would say eighty percent of my deals are from MLS. Eighty percent. I would say the same. Wow, wow! Doesn't now, that change your thinking a little bit? And both of you own construction companies. What would your advice be for someone who doesn't own a construction company to find and work with a contractor? What's your What's your best advice for someone to work with their contractor? To Hire a good contractor, not a cheap contractor. Okay, good. And like, pay, pay your contractor on time, right? And that's important. Um, I, I was a contractor in 2015. I got fed up with people. So you know what? I'm going to sell it. I cannot deal with people anymore. You do your, you do your best, and then you go, oh, I really don't like that. I'm going to hold on to $2,000. About a punch in the face. <laughs> so I ended up abandoning that business. You know, it provided me the jump start of a cash flow, allowing me to do real estate, allowing me to have all these, you know, fun things that I'm doing, I like to do. And I think quality contractor, right? And, um, you know, pay your contractor on time. Understand that they need to work for a living, they work with their hands. So don't shortchange them. You know, it's interesting because when you first start off investing, your concept is, let me pay the least I possibly can. And so what they do is they normally hire somebody who doesn't fulfill on their commitments, misses every target imaginable, and they have, you know, well, I'm speaking from experience, I'd have to bring somebody else in to finish the project. And then you learn that lesson very quickly. Pay your professionals, because that's why they're professionals. Like, find good ones and pay them, and then just set up a machine with them, right? 100%. Yeah. 100%. You don't want to overspend by hiring a cheaper contractor. Just yeah. Out. Who's overspent before where they thought that they were getting a deal, and then at the end of the day, because you had to hire somebody new, right? Yeah. Right? That's happened, I think, to all of us. Right? I think, like, with my first uh, bookkeeper, I went cheap, $30 an hour versus 60 right? And I ended up paying because the person at 30 did it wrong after six months, right? Okay, cool. When you hire a cheap plumber, you'll find out. Yeah, yeah. you hire a cheap plumber, you'll find out, right? Okay, um, what questions would you guys want to know from the audience? We've got 78 transactions here in the last 12 to 18 months. We got, let's say, 15 high-end luxury problem solving. I know you guys do deals in the back. Like, let's get you in. What question do you have? Any question? I want to know if you don't mind sharing, what is your wrong uh, for price per square foot for the flips? Price per square foot for the flips. That's a great question. So for renovation? Renovation. I would say about $40. Forty. Okay. Is that? I feel good, I feel good about it because I say yeah. I tell people fifty-five. Yeah. Okay. Use fifty-five dollars a cost. square foot. Is that a total? That's guy? your cost, right? That's my cost. That's right. So I tell people use fifty-five dollars a square foot if you're hiring a general contractor. Because by the way, the GC makes that difference. He uses other trades, your GC, to get your work done. Manages those people for a fee somewhere between. 
10, 12% on average. So if it costs you in the 40s to do it yourself, a GC doing it for you should charge you $55, $60 a square foot, then manages all of those people for you. We talk about that a lot, the difference between doing it yourself versus hiring a general contractor to kind of manage all those people for you. They're both good, they both work, but if you are you are personally the GC, you gotta find a plumber, an electrician, a concrete guy, a roof guy, a carpenter, a painter, a carpet dude, whatever you need versus a general contractor who hopefully has all those people already for you, pay more, hopefully for a little more stability and, and and confidence that you'll get when you ask for versus doing it yourself. I'd imagine yours is higher because yours is almost like new construction, yeah. right? What is yours at? 125, 125 ish. Yeah. Depends on whether I take the foundation work. Okay. That's still good. But that's, and, and $125 a square foot, that is really largely new construction. That's I mean, you're like, da you're down, right? You've got foundation and you're building everything up. Yeah, and, and then I'm not beating my subcontractors up either, right? You know, when they know that you're paying them on time, like normally I would text them, have my designers email them, hey, do you need money? Right? I want to show sincerity how I want to do business. My electrician's been with me for the last seven years. My plumber's been with me for the last 12 years. And my framer's been with me for the last seven or eight years. I use the same guys, and my, I have an in-house crew. We got about... Uh, 14 guys right now we're you know, uh, full time and uh, yeah, so we can control our consistency. Okay. There was a question over here. Gentleman with glasses. So I wanted to know how do you draw the line versus uh, uh, expect, I mean cheap contractor versus uh, How do you tell the difference yeah, between, the difference between well, Here's the thing. Yeah. How, yeah. Let me let me just read her. How do you tell the difference between somebody who's a cheap contractor and may not perform versus a good one? Exactly, because okay. I've had cheap contractors and they did really great. So is it about the money or, you know, so sometimes I think it's, it has nothing to do with, you know, the money issue. Because I had a contractor who charged me way less and did an amazing job. And, and I was skeptical at first. I'm like, this guy is really going to perform, but he did an exceptional job. So, but is that sustainable? Yeah, what happens, what, what I've found is that it's a newer contractor getting in, and they don't know their margins yet. And so they, they've got honor, integrity, they want to perform, but at the end of the day, they're like, I didn't make any money. I didn't make any money, so they're just going to use that as a reference. And then, they, and then the next guy got charged... A real price. A real price. Of the real price, real price but did not perform. So yeah. it was like, you know. Yeah. When, when do you. There, there are bad contractors. You know, the so they go. Uh, 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 they'll they do that for the first right. house, or maybe the second yeah. house. But yeah. after that, they'll be like. Uh, uh, yes, yes, it's right. Right. And you can charge more. At least you know that they did Yeah. I mean, they have a life too. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's a great point. They're business people. You want them to stay in business if they perform for you. So pay them more. I think. My, my crews have been with me for, for a long time. We keep hiring more and more crews, but uh, they've been with us for a long time. And when COVID happened, we stopped constructing for the time being. And uh, we let go of them. And everyone came back to them. Wow. So it's just I mean, that there's a reason for that. So. Well, I have a question. What's yeah. So what, maybe reverse engineer, like what's an acceptable profit margin for TC? For instance, I have a house right now. So the question is, what's an acceptable yeah. profit margin? Now, okay. um, I bought a new tool for 230. The ARB is 420. The contractor said he's too down. It's on hours. It doesn't really give me a budget, but he does excellent work. I don't have to babysit him once I pay him. He knows the material. He does that. I tried to sit there and say, okay, well, I'm going to the bathroom to the floor. He goes, Mr. Chad, I'm taking it away. It's on your kid. You know, so my point is, though, is if we want to break down the numbers, should he be making 20000 off of us? Like, if this even takes him eight things or less, what is, like, a good number to keep the GC motivated as a problem? I can answer that. Do you, you, you've had some good projects with this contractor that, like, worked out. You sold the house, made money. Yes. Now what do you give a shit what he made? Okay, just, okay, so just, 
Back to that last question. Yeah. He quoted 75000 on the last house. Yeah. And just like Rob said, he didn't make much money on it. So now the next house is doing 100 But the last house, we found termites, which cost us 7000 right. This house is going to be 100 Guess what? The $14,000 foundation problem, that's not in the budget. Plus, if you sure. find termites, there might be another set. So my point is, and now I said to him, his name is Garcia, I said, Mr. Garcia, you quoted me 100 I was willing to give it because I thought it was all in. Now there's a $14,000 foundation problem, which was obvious because you saw the picture of the water on the basement floor. And he goes, Mr. Dad, I just didn't pick up on it. Again, it's hard to find contractors in Stephen City. No one wants to go out there. So I'm going to bite my tongue. You should understand what is a big profit margin for like a six week, eight week job. I, 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 that's a, a good profit margin for a it, your average smaller contractor that's only doing one or two houses at a time, roughly 50% over cost for a labor in the two. If you know what the labor costs, so around here your labor might cost anywhere between 275 and 325 per man per day, depending on what they can do. And your materials, your materials. You can kind of you can go to the depot, you know what your materials cost. So that plus 50% is a decent margin for a decent contractor to get something done. I'm prepared, though, to make a relatively blanket statement for anybody here looking for a contractor to do their rehab project at a reasonable quality at a pretty good price. Find a contractor who's in about year three to five of having been in business. If they've been in business for less than a year, you have no idea if they'll be able to show up from day to day to week to week because they don't know. If they've been around for eight years or more, I guarantee you they're charging what they need to charge at at least that 50, 65 percent over cost margin. And hopefully you get what you pay for. You can find contractors that charge a fair amount and still don't perform. But if you want the guy who probably will perform, but probably also doesn't know enough yet about the business to charge what he should, a guy who's been around for at least three, less than seven years. That three to seven year sweet spot is that's all the it. contractors I know. That's their learning phase. Ask us how we know that. As, yeah, ask me how I know. We try to find these contractors anyway. So when do you have the time to go help them and figure out how many years? Because you have that's it's, your, it's, that's it's your not homework. Easy to find them. So yeah. Yeah. you know you got to go. We got a question. Three years, five years. I don't know when you guys are doing the rehab. So the question is, are you giving them pieces, to learn or, you, or are you testing them on pieces, or are you giving them the whole project? Okay. Well, right. let's, yeah. let's let them go. Okay. I prefer the whole project. And if they don't meet the timeline, they don't show up on time, I say goodbye to them very quickly. Yeah, you give them what two or three months? I, I, two or three months to figure it out? Yeah, no, no, two three weeks. Two or three weeks. Yeah, and look, give me your projection sheet. Tell me what you're gonna do based on the sequence. I would know whether they're a real contractor or they were a helper. Try to start as a contractor, right? Try to start. I don't mind to work with folks that work hard and wanting to get into the business, but you gotta show up. You gotta, you gotta do the work. So, no piecemeal for me. Well, I mean, so I don't think there's a right answer to this because, like, I have done both sides where I've given the project to a contractor and got them bitten. And, like, I mean, at the end of the day, I decided to be a contractor. And I just got my own license. And even now, I mean, there are problems. I mean, the labor problem, there's issues. So, I mean, there's absolutely no right answer. I mean, it, this business sounds easy, but it's not easy. It's a difficult business to be in. I mean, you have to be very aggressive. You have to keep running around. You have to do. I mean, you have to monitor your properties. You have to monitor your contractors all the time. So, I mean, I hate to say, but there is no right answer to this. So, I mean, let me let me ask a question. This is a marketing question. Are you monetizing your assets by having signs in your yards to get you more deals? Are you are you marketing? In those neighborhoods, or are you just like that's a really good question? So I, we kind of started doing that this year because okay. we need more deals. Right? Okay. So, uh, I mean, the, the best way to get deals is I mean, the same neighborhood. Sure. Because I can, I can, it's easier to manage those properties. And those properties, those neighborhoods are up and coming. So that's the best way to do I mean, we start doing that more marketing, more uh, 
direct marketing, Facebook marketing, things like that. So, yeah. And have you gotten any calls from a sign that you put like in the yard that this is what we do? No? Uh, Lee, how about you? Because I know you have no signs. My phone number is posted nowhere. Don't call me. Nothing. <laughs> None. Talk to the realtors. They know the real deals. And and, and uh, I, I, I don't think I have bought any project from a wholesaler. I'm sorry. Just normally what I find from wholesalers is they, um, they underestimate on the renovation cost. I'm being very transparent right now. And then they... Project the ARV super high, and then when I run it, I go, This is a waste of time. So I prefer to get to know my pockets, my neighborhoods, and to get to know the agents who performs in those areas, right? And I would not want to hire a Vienna agent to market my Arlington. Just because they can enter that on MLS, it doesn't mean that they're good. When I need to see the team, I need to see the marketing system. You know, um, my the agents I work in DC, they're fantastic. Um, two of my projects right now, I haven't even finished yet, right? And uh, went out of contract, and I think I set a record, and I didn't have to go online. So it's all about how you carry yourself, and it's all about what type of philosophy you want to do. There's no right and wrong to do this. Um, Wholesaling deals still good, but I just don't like them. Can I say something that I know that they're not saying, but I know that they do? Because sometimes what happens is they're so they're so in the business that they don't quite understand what they're doing. But from an outside perspective, I can see what they're doing. Both of these guys move very quickly. They're certain. Their money is lined up. They already know the numbers in their head. So one thing he said, once I know that I've got a deal, you're like aggressive on that, right? You're emailing, you're calling, you're following up. Same thing I noticed with you. Like once he smells money, he's like there, right? He's like all over it. He's not waiting. He's calling. He's texting me. Hey, I want to get like, what are we going to do this? Let's get this thing signed. Let's wrap this thing up, right? Coleman has brought up a deal a couple of times now from a guy that you know that, that brings you good deals. What was the average time on market for those deals? Five, six hours. Six. Yeah. We were, but was one of them we tried to get the guy back after like 45 minutes and it was gone. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, Crazy. you got to be ready to go. So you got to be ready to go, right? So you have to have your private funds or your hard money funds in place. Mm -hmm. You got to have like your knowledge about the neighborhoods in, in place. You need to know your agent network. You got to have that in place. Because speed is what wins in this market, right? You got a question? Yeah, you had mentioned that uh, that you see sometimes eighty percent of your deals in the MLS. How how can you tell us a little more about that? Because you know, so many eyes are on things in the MLS. I would think it would be hard to really get something below market because everyone else is jumping on it too. So how do you do that? 80% coming from so MLS? So because I'm building a, almost like a new construction, pretty much a new construction, uh, the way I analyze the deals differently, um, I take each individual deals, I analyze each, and each, uh, each individual deals. So I look at my setback. I argue with the county on disturbance. That's why they don't want to see me there anymore. And um, so there's a restraining order on right, it. pretty much, right, pretty much. Um, so I argue about the 2,500 square feet disturbance, you know. And one day I asked my civil engineer. I said, "Hey, can you tell me a quarter of a pie?" He goes, "What do you mean?" I said, "Look, my 2,500 square feet disturbance. You draw the line in perpendicular and in 90 degrees." I said, I really need five square feet. So I just round it off. Is there a five print on that I cannot do? No, no such a thing. Well, great. Round it off. Find me quarter of a pie. So I was able to save. And that's how we were able to get our John Marshall property done in four months, right? I mean, I got a permit. Even my banker goes, how did you do that? Right? So you got to understand what you're looking for. So when I bought the property, the property been on the market for quite some time. Nobody wants it. And I went in there. I knew exactly what I want to do. I know how to work with the disturbance and I know what to do with it. And, you know, it works for me. Be because I think that the summary answer to that, Sloan, is that Lee sees value where other people might not see it. You're willing to fight fights that other people might not fight to add things that that a regular rehabber isn't looking to add. 
do work that a regular rehabber isn't looking to do. So you're able to buy something on the MLS because you make it completely different than what it is, and you will do what you have to do to make it get there. Right? 100%. The truth is, the fight part is the fun part. Right? You argue with the county. You push back just to understand how far you can get. How about you, Anisha? Are you doing that? Are you... My business model is a bit different. I mean, the way, so to answer his question, uh, I try to analyze the new listings that came on the market every single day. And I know my neighborhoods, know the cities, know the counties, what sells. I know Fairfax County, if there's a townhouse under 400000 that's a deal. I mean, you don't find those these days. And uh, I know if I fix it up, I could probably sell it for closer to 600000 Same goes with if it's Alexandria City, things like that. So once you start doing that, you'll know your markets. And uh, I try to pick up those deals from MLS, and the next day I'm on it. I'm calling those agents, I'm writing offers, I mean, they'll probably receive the first offer. I try to make sure that it doesn't go to the open house. I mean, that's the only way you can get the, those deals in this market. Otherwise, I mean, if you wait till the open house, and I mean, you're fighting with 12 other offers. Quick follow-up question. How many offers are you writing right now on average per week? So, I mean, there was a time where I was writing 10 offers a day. 10 offers per day? 10 people per day. Hey, I'd like to buy your house. Here's my proof of funds. I'd like to buy, right? Absolutely. That's that's a numbers game, right? And I'm ready to buy them all. And you're ready to buy them all? <laughs> I love it. I mean, my your... offers are serious. I mean, I, I'm not, if I offer, if I write to buy an offer, I mean, I don't, I haven't backed out on an offer. And what's your hit rate on those 10 a day? On average? One or two. One or two. Yeah. So to get 78 a year, you've got to make 10 a day to get one or two accepted a week, roughly? Yeah. Right. So that's, that's the other way to do it. Yeah. Volume. Volume. Just, you just make offers to everybody, or you look for opportunities that other people aren't looking for. That's it. There's no easy deals out there. The easy shit is gone. Uh, we, gone. we did them five years ago. <laughs> What's left is not the easy stuff. It's, it's doing hard work to either make a lot of offers, be efficient about making offers, or look for value where value can be found, or where you have to fight for it to, to create an opportunity where it doesn't already exist. Sorry. Oh, if you came out looking for the easy stuff, the easy stuff is kind of gone. But give it another couple of years, it'll get easy again once things yeah. happen. Yeah. Like, I mean, uh, I know you had a question regarding how much a contractor should make. And we, we buy properties from wholesalers all day long. If the numbers make sense for us, I'll buy that property. It doesn't matter if the wholesaler is making 50000 or 100000 It doesn't matter to me. I look at my pocket, not their pocket. I mean, they're probably making a lot more than... I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. What is your ARV and what is your buying price and what is the GC charging you and how much do you want to make? That's what matters. I mean, the contingency. All right. And my point is this. If you ask for the labor and you ask for the material, what is their profit on top of that? Like, okay, when a person does it, like, if a contractor comes to you and says it's 100000 Right, but you know there might be a foundation issue, termites. He's not quoting you for landscaping. What is the profit margin that a agency should make after labor and material? Fifty percent. Fifty percent. That's. Fifty percent. 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 Are you, lending, are you taking financing or your own money for that? So I'm taking financing, but I'm prepared to pro close a property in cash. Because that's the aggressive offer. So you doing hard money or private? Hard money. Hard money. What's your average profit margin? Average profit margin. Uh, before closing the deal, and what's my projected? Um, I don't know. I try to make. Thirty, forty thousand dollars on a deal, like a regular house. And uh, if uh, I'm sorry, percentage, four, percentage, four or five percent. Yeah. That's my profit. Yeah. So there, he's doing volume. So it's interesting. Like when I, I think about like Mark and I, Mark and I would always be looking to swing for the fences on each one, right? They're doing volume. Well, what I like to think of swinging for the fences is like like 50,000. If I can't project that the deal will make 50 grand, I'm not really interested in it. 
but Lee yeah. averages probably six figures and above on your deals, right? Sure. So, so, sometimes. Is that sure? Some, sometimes maybe better. I get lucky once in a while. But but you have a longer time horizon, more invested in it. It's all a risk return, right? It's not really so much about the, the total dollars. It's how much am I risking for how much I'm making? Because this isn't the only thing we can do with our money. We can invest it in other stuff. Bitcoin today, maybe not really the greatest thing, or maybe Bitcoin today was a really good idea. Bitcoin yesterday, or two days ago, would have been bad. Anyway, the point is there's other stuff you can invest your money in. It's all about what's the best return on what you're risking. I believe long-term in real estate, Long term, though, for a rehab is six months. So, what do I believe in six months, and what do I want to make in six months as a return? That's what you have to decide. So, I've got I've got another question for these guys. So, fixing and flipping is earned income. Being a contractor is earned income. Being a realtor is earned income. That's not where wealth is created, guys. Wealth is created in owning assets long term that get paid off over time. So, my question is, what are you guys doing? Are you buying rentals? Or are you just turning money, right? So, I, mean, I wish I had that idea 10 years back. Right? Okay. I mean, you can always look back 10 years back. I wish I bought these properties 10 years back and held it. Yeah. I wish I bought these properties 20 years back and held it. I mean, same question arises now. I mean, you'll be looking at these 10 years later. 100%. I wish I bought these properties 10 years back when the interest rates were, was 5%, and I only put down 20%, and my, my money would have been four times. And the tenant is paying the mortgage. Yeah. So, based on that idea, we are scaling up on our rentals. One hundred percent. Like I one hundred percent agree. Like one of the biggest regrets was in two thousand eight. For those that know, when I used to run this group, I used to organize a foreclosure bus tour, and I would put like twenty of us on a bus to go look at foreclosures, right? And that's actually how I met Mark. I met Mark like that, right? And it was so interesting because. The sky was falling, and we were buying property, but nobody else was. People were scared. We stopped buying, Anish, yeah. in 2010, 2011, because we thought everything was overpriced. Because we bought it for so cheap in 2008 that everything looked expensive, right? Anybody else? Like, anybody that's been an investor a long time has bought properties, they're like, why would I buy that thing? Like, I bought it for, like... Sixty thousand dollars, and now it's six hundred thousand dollars. Whatever. Half a dozen houses, like two miles from here, all bought under a hundred thousand dollars. That didn't mean it was a bad idea to buy them for a hundred and ten in two thousand eleven and twelve. But at the time, you're like, oh my god, I got a percent. Why would I ever pay a hundred when I got one for eighty? Think longer term than that. Think if you could make the numbers work. If you can make the math work, you buy them and you hold them. Right, that's the key. So whether you're a realtor, a contractor, a flipper, in construction, what matters is holding these assets. So the number one thing that people always say to themselves is like, well, I don't have the cash though. I don't have the cash to buy them and hold them. This is where partnerships, like you guys together, this is where partnerships come into play. Like if I was to find a house and I didn't have the money, I might come to you and say, hey, I've got this house. You put up the money, let's do this thing 50-50. And if you don't like the deal, I'll go find somebody else that does. Because the person that controls the asset controls the terms. Right? Yes. I'm Speak up. Sell my house here shortly. Okay. You're going to sell your house? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And here's I know house. a good realtor. Uh, <laughs> so, so I'm in, I'm in the game. Um, okay. I do roughly 20 houses a year. That's awesome. Um, the equity I get for my house now is roughly 300. 300? 300. Okay. My average profit over five years. Primary? Uh, my, my primary. Yeah, so tax free? Tax free. Okay. So my, our average profit has been uh, 31%. Wow. So if, awesome. If I take that 250, 300K that I have, right? Yep. Um, I flip it. I usually flip it three times a year, but let's just say I do it two times a year. Right? Yep. And let's say I don't make my 30%, but I hit 20%. Yep. Right? So 20% of 250 is $50,000. Right? And then you do that twice a year, that's $100,000. You compound that over the next two or three years. Yep. It seems like I'd make more money investing the money in my current infrastructure than I would. Okay. Why do you have to sell the house? Why don't you just get an equity line? 
and you use, tap the equity line and create arbitrage that way. I mean, I want to sell your house, but it might make more sense to do that. Yeah, get a HELOC. And you get like 200000 instead of the 300000 right? So just something to think about, right? So what he wants to do is... still strong on holding on to Yes. think about too, what if the market was to go down? But that's okay. It's going to go down, but it's going to come back. But then when I do try to sell it the 10 years or 15 years from now, I have the capital gains, but I don't have that now. Well, not if, not if you have a HELOC. It's your primary residence. So if you sell it, no, oh, it, somewhere else. oh, 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 because you've already decided to go somewhere else. Well, yeah, right, then you, you, out, right. yeah. So those are my okay, you guys have been in the business a long time. What do you, what, what's the biggest regret that you have while you've been in the business? Should have bought and more. You should have bought and hold more. Yeah. Yeah. The number one regret, and I talk to a lot of investors, the number one regret of every developer I've met, of every investor, is that they didn't hold more property. So I would just try to figure out a way to hold it. And if not, so, I mean, it's fine. You can sell. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, love, I love that you're thinking that way anyways. So... Got it. So you guys have organized all of it. So three, we, we get them right yeah. and then they take it to that. How many did you do last year? Last year wasn't the best year. Okay. Last year was the best. But this year we've done, we did like 12. Yeah, 12. Just 12. We're going to have you guys up here next time. It'll be cool. Okay. So Rob, holler out the 30 second synopsis of what you were talking about. Okay. So the 30 second synopsis, I'm sorry, I thought you guys could hear, was the question was, I've got this primary, should I sell it, take the cash, and compound that money, right? And I was like, why don't you just get an equity line, right? Tap the equity line and create your arbitrage on the money instead of selling it. You know, and he was just trying to figure out the math, because he's looking at the math. Okay. As long as the, the lending market is good and you can get good leverage on that property that you already own, I would think most people would tend to agree. To take the money out of it, keep it, as long as it's still cash for you, and use that money somewhere else rather than sell it, right? Yep. That'd be the advice? Yeah, that's the advice. Okay, guys, let's do this. I want you guys to network with each other, right? I want you guys to... Do people exchange business cards anymore? I don't think so, right? They don't do that, right? It's like, hit me up on Instagram or Facebook. So I want you guys to literally network with each other because the power is in the relationships around you, right? So thank you so much for coming out. Have a beer on Mark Beckett. The tab is not <laughs> And Lee and Anish, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, guys. Right? Thank we appreciate you. you.